so I mean, it's basically been ten years. Next year is the ten year thing. Yeah, it is. What are we gonna do? See, we're gonna have to do something uh, a little bit special. Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, ten years is a long time actually to be doing. We've been doing this for ten years now. Rapperty boo. Rapperty boo. Yeah, <laughs> rock it up a little bit. <laughs> Fly on the wall, kind of thing. Not oh, well, too well, serious. I've <clears throat> well, I've, I've torn or the recording. Maybe the, the recording record, uh, as a DVD. Yeah, fly on the wall. Just, just the recording process. Yeah, it doesn't need to be like feature length film. No, is it? You know, just no. something. Thirty minutes, forty minutes, maybe. Yeah, maximum. Yeah. Otherwise, people will get bored of looking at your ugly mug, lad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, OK, 10-year DVD, CD, that sounds really good. Remaster some old tracks, well, re-record some old tracks. Well, re-record rather than just remaster, so just put... Actually, yeah, we could just do that, actually. Um, well... It's, it's the time thing, that's it. It's probably we've got enough time, but we could just... We could get in and literally re-record our favourite tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, from, t from top to bottom. Yeah. I might, go, I might go and put a little bit of whiskey in my tea. I'm that excited. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so coast. A ten year distraction. Well, well, well. Ha <laughs> ha. How you doing? No more pedal tuners. I think I'll just do that one again. Yeah, so having made the decision to um, record the, the album this year, the 10 album, um, we then thought, okay, now what? Because the band is very spread out. So um, I'm living in the west coast of Scotland. Um, Chris is in the uh, far south of England and uh, Paul's now in Denmark. <laughs> Yeah. 
I remember the first gigs. They were so funny because we were playing in all these um, like real rubbish pubs in, in Southampton, you know. Um, and we had no idea what kind of turnout we would have at some of these gigs, but we, we were basically forcing our music on people. So I am here in Edinburgh after a kind of a bumpy flight. But it's good to be back in Scotland again, and uh, yeah. Uh, putting all the guide tracks together so that Finley can record his bappity boom boom bass. Slap in the bath. Slap the bath. Did we do the scale bit? Did we record that? No, <clears throat> not yet. Okay. Use um, long E's then, and then put me into the do 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 bit one and I'll do the chorus, and then I'll do that link. No, did we not record that? Oh no, we did, didn't we? Let's hear that. I'll bring you there on, onto exactly that. Exactly right, aye. D? Yeah. I think it's a D? Yeah. Okay. Nice one, mate. My musical journey started when I was just a wee itch in the pants, I suppose. Um, I grew up in a family full of musicians. My mum was a musician, my dad was a musician. My mum was always getting us involved in playing different musical instruments. I played the cornet for a little while, uh, played in a little pipe band, playing the drums. Um, and then I kind of didn't do much at all for a, quite a long time. A click. Okay. Recording technology has um, enabled many um, different approaches. You know, we could ultimately just take the band in a room again and play all the songs together um, and that brings a special something for sure if you do take that approach um, but logistics and costs and, and real life you might call it um, has an influence so nowadays the, the, the technology has made it possible to to begin those uh, projects projects maybe in one studio um, say in Paul's studio he'll typically put down uh, you know, click tracks and, and core instruments and what we call a guide vocal, which is not the vocal that ends up being on the on the finished version, but just uh, gives you a, a way to navigate the song. That's perfect. Do you want to put the two in? So, chorus. So we would play and we would have this massive sound system that we would set up in, in these pubs and whoever was in there, you know, whether you liked it or not, you were going to hear this thing.
playing mostly our own songs as well. We had one a few covers in there, but um, we, we were playing our own stuff. More and more people would come in just because, I think it was just because it was so flipping loud. Sounds good, but the, the last fill could perhaps be a little bit more exciting. Yeah. This one here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Little, some, something. Something a bit more, a bit more flashy. Faster. Yeah. stuff there is there. That's all there. And the first long notes are all there. So we're now just dealing with that bit in the middle. What okay. works with it. So it ends up feeling right, I think, on a kind of um Because that will work with the drums going double time there with that. So let's hear that bit in the middle then, or I'm going to just go for it and I'll put that down. You can play me in from the longs if you want. Just give you a little bit of run up. You won't hear the bass well. Feel and I'll make it a little bit busier. Okay. <laughs> I guess it was in the uh, late 90s. Um, picked up drum kit, and me and Paul, my brother, started a band, um, and it was basically for charity and we'd rehearse for a whole year and we did this really big gig and it was great. And then again after that I kind of went off, had a family and uh, didn't do a lot. And then Paul came to me one day with these songs that he'd written. I thought the songs were great. Um, and you know, the, the whole thing about starting a band came up. And uh, we, 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 were, we were gaining some traction around the uh... You know, within these pubs, just gaining like you know, small following. And before you know it, we we, we just had loads of people that were coming to see us play. And uh, you know, what what you know, what's going to happen next, sort of thing. I'm trying to record the harmonium for Ghost Down the Boy. It's got a creepy sound, so uh, I'm just going to use one microphone, I think. One microphone, one harmonium, one song. Let's see if this works. <laughs>
Yeah. As far as the guitars go on this album, um, it basically comes down to two uh, Fender machines. So when I started playing guitar, uh, I was 11, age 11, and I got to 13 before I ventured onto electric guitar, and that was a Fender Stratocaster copy. Um, so not a Fender, in other words, uh, a copy. And uh, that... I think kind of set a bit of a scene for me really just the feel of the neck and the, the body design and everything about it I've always uh, had strats and fenders and things so uh, more so than ever nowadays um, having this uh, Telecaster here and um, this is the main guitar uh, that I use so Telecasters, Stratocasters and, and that's that's pretty much it and variations on these uh, machines. <laughs> Definitely give me some of that top gear. Yeah. <laughs> This one um, does most of the work on the coast uh, gigs and also on this uh, album. So it's an interesting uh, Telecaster actually because usually the reason for buying a Telecaster would be the, as far as I was concerned, was the electrics, the pickup uh, configurations, essentially the sound the guitar uh, produces uh, is very, very famous. It's done on two single coil uh, pickups. Um, so this guitar was a bit of a departure, I think, for Fender in that they chose to use uh, humbucker uh, pickups, uh, these things here, um, as the, the the type of sound. So thankfully I was able to get a bit of a deal on this guitar where I could actually play it, gig it, tour it, uh, before having to actually buy one. Um, and the, the Fender seemed to have hit the sweet spot with it where it's still sparkly, um, like, a, like a normal Telecaster, normal pickup uh, set up in a telly. But it's uh, also because of the humbuckers, it's very fat and warm and, and big, a uh, much bigger sound than, than the single coils uh, give you. Uh, they're also very balanced, so it's a nice even uh, volume from each string uh, uh, on the guitar. So yeah, this is it's become a bit of a favourite. It's uh, a really nice uh, machine. It's an American uh, Telecaster, and uh, it produces it does most of the of the live work with coast so of course the sound of coast it's it's big i mean it's it's getting bigger really with the expansive soundscapes and the big 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 sound um the guitar needs to be able to uh, cut through and and deliver um and that's so far the best guitar i've found for that is this telecaster <laughs> So you do that, reamping the Hammond organ. So playing the Hammond organ back through my speakers and recording the audio onto the microphones back onto the gear with the tape machine uh, thingy. And we started recording this song called uh, the Work Song. Um, and I remember setting up all these um, 
just little things I could hit in his lounge, you know? And we had this stool and I had the drumsticks and, you know, we're just getting a groove on in, in the lounge. And uh, we recorded this song called The Work Song, which is now actually called The Caller. I, I cherish those times just because there were, there were a lot of fun, a lot of, lot of fun times, you know, the van breaking down and things like that. You know the the PA equipment. We had we had this really dodgy sound engineer in the beginning, in the really early days. Um, he must have been about ninety years old, but he was he used to glue the speakers together and stuff before a gig, and then like halfway through the gig, that like the PA would be on fire and things like that, and the drummer would disappear. I remember we had this drummer called Mongo, and um, we, we 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 were playing this gig right, and his mon his monitor that was. Uh, that was what he uses to, to hear his, uh, his hear what he was playing and everything else. His monitor had basically started, you know, smoke and flames and stuff coming off it. And um, I turned around and um, I said, uh, Oi, Mongo! And he looked at me and he's like, What? And I said, You're on fire! And he went, Oh, thanks! And he, this is right in the middle of the gig, you know, and everything's pumping away and it's, it's really loud and stuff. And I said, No, look! You're on fire, and then uh, and I remember Chris running from the from the back of his percussion rig, and uh, <laughs> said, "By this time, you can't see anything. By the way, it's uh, it's just a complete whiteout on the stage." And he goes he's running around the back and unplugs Mongo's speaker, and uh, <laughs> we're still playing away. And uh, we just can't believe. It. I mean, we got a big applause after it, you know. But it was um, it was just mental. I mean, some of the you know just some of the people we had involved and some of the. To some of the things, you know, I, I think Coast was has definitely been like the modern day Spinal Tap. Playing around with some uh, DX7 sounds, maybe to put on this track. So some of the other work falls to a Strat the caster, so uh, that's just on single coils, very conventional uh, Strat setup, probably the most famous electric guitar um, ever. Um, so that takes care of the kind of thinner, more um, plucky kind of sounds when you need a real kind of attack, something that's quite piercing but, but thinner, um, then I would tend to use the Stratocaster for that. But this Telecaster, I must say, is uh, a, a piece of genius, really, um, by by Fender for me. It's uh, beautifully made, plays really well. It's it stays in tune. <laughs> That's important, and yeah, it sounds great. And we play it through a, a Mesa Boogie uh, amp. So a little Mesa Boogie. It's just a small thing, a little amplifier that lives its whole life on ten watts. It's switchable to more power should you want it um, but it lives on 10 watts and it's an all valve amp and it just sings it's the most incredible uh, amplifier i've ever actually played just an amazing thing <laughs> Nice. 
you can spend some time shaping things, experimenting with ideas, um, when and as you have the time, you're able to do that. Um, so basically we shape the songs and they basically build, so it's like, uh, you know, forming something over many weeks and months, um, when and as the, the, the time and, and, and so on is available. last one, you do 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 and then you do that do 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 I reckon just go down 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 done Me and Finn done in the studio for the day. Oh, bass, 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 bass. We ended up um, actually booking some studio time, and it's my first time in studio. It's pretty nerve wracking, really. People were saying, "Hey, great! This is really cool. When's the first gig? You know, where where do you play?" And I'm, it never even entered my head that we would have to get a band together and go out and play this stuff live. I wasn't interested in playing live. It took. Probably, we were working on this album for a good year. Paul was writing a lot of songs, um, a lot of good songs. You know, I, I, I was a studio guy. I just wanted to make music in a studio. Uh, I never even saw myself as a singer, to be honest with you. It's just, it just kind of came about that way, really. Got a band together, made, made loads of auditions and met lots of colourful people. Mm -hmm. the click off so we get uh, oh no by the way it's the second hit it loses a lot of pace down I just hear that again yeah because it's slowing it down seemed, I know but it just seemed weird the way it, it seemed to fall there might be the click that's perfectly unnatural <laughs> Is that 
<laughs> you almost <laughs> there. Do you want me to do it again? Uh, I... Yeah. Hi, my name is Henry Clement. I'm Paul Eastham's piano technician. So, I think uh, it sounds nice now. The rest is up to Paul. <laughs> well, it's another, another synth day today. Um, I got this... <laughs> it's amazing, actually. It's an old Technics, and it's it's really old. And um, I, I found it on eBay for about 25 euros. And um, this is the very first keyboard I learned to play on when I was a boy. So, I mean, I've, obviously I've added reverb and stuff to it, but I just uh, I just love these old keyboards. So I'm going a bit further down now. I've got my uh, Roland D5, which I bought in a pub out here in Denmark. There was a like a a British bar, British pub, and uh, I just met this guy in there. We got talking about keyboards, and he said he had this Roland D5 for sale. So I just said, uh, yeah, if it works, I'll buy it. <laughs> And it works, and I love it. Bum, ba, bum, dun, 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 dun. Uh, yeah, sorry. Well, that will satisfy my uh, Vangelis need. Ten years is a long time to be doing, you know, to be to be doing this. 
You know, every single band is on the verge of breakup, who, whatever band you're in. And we've kept this going. I actually started off with just a, a K on drum and uh, a set of bongos, a couple of shakers, um, just to get the feel of, you know, what a percussionist kind of does. What is that? Ah, that's um, that's Telegraph Road by Dice Straits. Oh yeah. Well, just because of that, I'm gonna use it. Now I find myself, you know, I can be playing one, two, three instruments at the same time, theoretically. So um, I generally use uh, congas. Um, I have various um, different shakers. So beat the broken drum and play your sour groove. Your loneliness will walk that final mile with you. Yeah. Loneliness will walk that final mile with you. Nah, that was crap. It was even stiffer. You see the demon stabbing down your glory road. And in the glass where every river seems to flow You cut the words from heaven as you shut them out You, you are incredible you Where we are now is that uh, the songs are, are together and various other people have come in and, and done their parts 
and other, there's, there's contributions. So getting Georgie back on vocals, um, the singer who was on the first album with us. Oh, it's a long way home. It's a long way home. Yeah, really good. Thanks. Really good. Uh, we'll bank up a few more. Two. It's a long way home. That was awful. <laughs> like the mini Ripperton version. It's a long way home. <laughs> <laughs> he goes like a flipping opera singer. Oh, really? Well, it's bad. It's not good. Oh, <laughs> let's, um... I put that vibrato on, you know. What's that? I put it on. Like, I know at the end it's like... Oh. Baby. Oh, the baby's calling. I think it would be if it was, you know. Better. Yeah. <laughs> Let me try it again. All right. Yep. Ooh, I'll do it like that. Ooh, ooh. Hi. Kind of more angelic. That could yeah. be quite nice. Ooh. That could be quite nice. I had to take a breath. That's right. Let's we'll have a listen. What you doing? What you doing there? What you doing in my studio? We're up to a point now where we're just about to start uh, mixing, and then that's been woven tightly into the diary between tours. The, the the whole idea behind it really was not to release a whole album full of brand new music. Um, Maybe re -re what, to just re-record some of the earlier stuff, some of the stuff we love playing live, actually. Um, in, in, in our sense, this is an album just for us, actually. I think we're being really selfish with this. So we go into the mixing stage next, and then thereafter, you know, the mixing thing ultimately is just deciding um, how loud each instrument should be relative to one another and also what kind of ambience the, the music should sit in. We, uh, we decided we'd do an album and we'll re-record some of the old material and try and put some different influences in the music that we previously had. You know at one time you might have recorded in a big open space. If you do record in a, in a big place you'll, you'll inevitably ca capture the, um, the ambience of that place. Um, nowadays it's uh, certainly in my own place, I run a, a my, my studio is quite a dry, uh, small a very controlled ambience uh, and then we'll simply add um, an artificial ambience to it. We, we recorded them the way that we play them live as well. Um, so when we set out to do this we, we said right okay it's, it's not going to be uh, an album full of accordions and bagpipes and whistles and all that nonsense. We basically just said let's just do a rock album. That was the plan and we've worked really hard on it and I think the tracks are sounding great. So roll on the 10th year with Coast. So those types of things give you again a great, greater degree of control. That's all at the mixing stage. And then um, off to mastering, which is the assembling of the, the final uh, CD, the final album that people will hear. And uh, job done. I've been able to draw from Coast, I think it's just a, you know, apart from the fact that it's, it's given me a, you know, um, a, a career in music, you know, all of this studio and stuff and everything is, is because of that. And the thing that I've drawn from this the most, I think it's the people that I've met, you know. I've met some very interesting people along this trip. Um, some of them who have remained uh, and, and uh, you know, become and remain uh, very loyal friends and, and great friends and almost you know, part of the family. And the idea behind doing this, uh, this DVD is uh, it's just to show you how we've done it, really. Um, it is a very, very plain black and white uh, documentary. It's not, there's no frills attached to this, really. Everything was done in two studios um, here in, in my, my studio here in Denmark, which is at my home. 
and uh, and back in Oban in uh, in Scotland, which is uh, Finlay's uh, private studio. And we've we've had it from you know being nosedived to being sailing to being you know, but we've kept this going. Uh, that's because we love what we do. We believe what we do, and um, it's it's a big part of who we are.